And that verse of scripture says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And I, I knew that the Lord was talking to me. And I do believe as you respond to the revelation that God gives to you, that he will give you more. Welcome to Pacific Garden Mission. And as you can see, winter is here and it is difficult for the homeless. I spoke to a young man in our day room yesterday, a 25 year old man, and I asked him what brought him here and he said, I'm homeless for the first time. Imagine in conditions like this, with temperatures at night going down into single digits and the times below zero, with a fresh blanket of snow, with a suitcase and luggage, and nowhere to go. Boy, that's tough. But I am so thankful that Pacific Garden Mission is here, and it really is a lifeline to those that need help. I want you to listen today to these testimonies and to the message, but I want you to continue to pray for Pacific Garden Mission. This is a difficult time for many of the homeless, and thank God that we are here. I want to invite you inside so you can see what God is doing through Pacific Garden Mission. Thank you, and God bless you. Each week we invite you in to Pacific Garden Mission to see what God is doing right here in Chicago and we're grateful you joined us today. Today we have two testimonies of men whose lives were changed here uh, at Pacific Garden Mission followed by a sermon, a gospel message of Jesus Christ. And what I want to point out today is many of you who have watched the program over the last few months and years know that a lot of times we'll do this part in the day room and you'll see the men or women who are just waiting for help. They've come here for food, clothing, and shelter, but the most important needs they have had met here are their spiritual needs, where they meet Jesus Christ and he begins to transform their lives. Today is no different. And I'm sitting in a classroom, actually it's a chapel here at Pacific Garden Mission. Some of the men are coming in to get ready for a class. It's the Billy Sunday Room. And this is an area, it's a nutritive environment. It's quiet, it's safe, it's a place where they'll open up the Word of God and someone will bring forth some instruction for them. And the difference here is that some of the men really want change. They want God to change their life and they're fully committed to partnering with God so that he can take them to their highest potential. I walked through these doors, I sat in this classroom, I received help from Christ and he did change my life. And I know as you're watching this program, you'll be challenged and encouraged, he can change your life too. No matter where you are, we're all a work in progress and God wants to take us to our highest potential until we meet him personally in heaven. So be encouraged and challenged as you watch these testimonies. These are two men that walked through these doors years, years ago and they are now pastors and leaders here at Pacific Garden Mission. One is Pastor Percy. We're gonna start with his testimony first and then we're gonna finish with our mission chaplain, Pastor McNeil two outstanding men of God who want to share what God is doing in their lives. Amen. How can I amen tonight? All right, I need to say, somebody say amen real quick just for practice, amen. 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 I'm coming through. We're going to sing out. One, two, three. When I was 16 years of age, I joined the street gang over on the west side of Chicago. And I was affiliated with that gang for a number of years and got myself into trouble quickly. I was dealing drugs, involved in gang activity. And I was sent to the state penitentiary at the age of 17. I was released after being there for two and a half years. Uh, and I learned absolutely nothing the first time. I went right back that same summer, 2002. It was in October 2002 the Lord got my attention. And I got saved um, in Cook County Jail in 2002 of October. Um, God got my heart. I began to read the Bible behind bars in prison. I began to do, go to Bible studies. And we had people come in from different churches who will conduct um, gospel services similar to what we do here at Pacific Guard Mission today. And so I went to those services, the Lord got a hold of my heart, and upon being released from prison, uh, I was sent here to Pacific Guard Mission, which to me was definitely divine providence. In fact, Mom, I had family here who I could have went home to live with, um, but while I was in prison, I would think by providence again, my family moved to Jackson, Mississippi. And the way it works with the parole system, if your family is out of state, I wasn't allowed to parole out of state. 
And so I found myself having nowhere to go for the first time in my life. And so I talked to a counselor in prison and we sat down and talked and she looked for somewhere for me to go. First thing came up was Pacific Guard Mission. And so I said, okay, well, I didn't know anything about the mission. Okay, I'll, I'll go. And so I came here to Pacific Guard Mission again, December 30th of 2004. I'm on parole from State Penitentiary. Um, right away, I joined our Bible program, which is for one year here at PGM. In fact, I met Pastor Phil, who is our president now, that first day I came here. I was walking down the hallway, and I saw this guy with a suit on. I said, he must be a preacher or something here. And sure enough, it was Pastor Phil. And he handed me a, um, a Hershey's candy bar. He does that to this day. He's been doing that since he's been here. He handed me a candy bar. And, you know, as simple as of act of kindness as that is, it kind of reached me because it, it made me realize this may be okay because I was kind of hesitant about being here. And so just showing that kindness gave me some uh, comfort about being here at PGM. It encouraged me to join the program, which I did. I was here for one year. I graduated. I uh, felt the Lord lead me to go into ministry to preach the gospel. And so I was able to go to um, Day Spring Bible College Seminary. And so I was there for four and a half years. And, you know, I grew up again in the inner city of Chicago on the west side and um, Bellwood, Maywood area. And so I had never been anywhere outside of the city. The gospel of Christ is a message that reaches all people, whether you're black or white, whether you're rich or poor. I see poor people here at PGM each day who respond to the gospel. And I was able to see wealthy people out in Lake Zurich respond to the gospel as well. And so we see that God's message is for all, whether you're rich or whether you're poor. The message is, is the same, Jesus saves. So I've been serving here now for the last four years on the pastoral staff, I'm teaching Bible classes, I'm counseling sessions, and I'm having the opportunity to reach the men and women who I know, in my opinion, are just like me. Uh, coming here to Mission Lost and need some guidance and need someone to help them. And so it was, it's definitely a blessing to come here every day and to serve somewhere where the Lord changed my life. Uh, and never, when I came here homeless, I think back 10 years ago, I had no idea I would be working here 10 years later. And, and never alone, a pastor <laughs> preaching the gospel of Christ. Um, when I was in Bible college, they taught me something called the hand gesture. And I used that to um, present what the gospel is. And I can just kind of use this quickly. I would do this hand gesture. I let my right hand represent the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and my left hand represents uh, mankind. This wallet represents sin. And so I use this illustration all the time. Um, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 21 that he hath made us to be he has made us to be sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so Jesus Christ literally took all the sins of the world upon himself, and now God sees us being in Christ. And so I share that gospel message here at PGM. And I see men and women respond to the message. They get saved. They trust in Christ. They accept the free gift of eternal life. And I see some of those same, same men and women have an opportunity to join the program. The New Life program, which is geared towards discipling men and women. And I see men join the New Day program, which is geared towards um, addiction recovery. And that's a huge problem here at Pacific Guard Mission. And we thank God that our president had the vision to start their ministry. And we're praying that men will respond to that. And we know it's a need. Men here need to be set free from strong ghost addiction, but the first step is always giving them the gospel, which is, um, in fact, the gospel can be summed up in 10 words. It's a simple message. Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. That's the message, and that's the message that's been preached at Pacific Garden Mission, I would say, the whole 138-year history, and so we thank God for that. I've worked closely with both these men. Pastor Percy and I taught career development, and Pastor McNeil has been a great friend of mine and an inspiration because he discipled me when I walked through these doors and encouraged and helped me even through my marriage here at Pacific Garden Mission. So I'm grateful to introduce him next. I really am amazed at what God has done in my life because certainly when God brought me here back in 1979, uh, my life was uh, an absolute mess. And according to society, I was a drug addict. I had been told that I was drug addict slash alcoholic and so forth. And I had made many, many attempts to change my life, but uh, it was any attempt at change was only temporary. But on March 25th, 1979, here at Pacific Garden Mission, I heard the transforming message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in particular, um, it was Matthew chapter 11 and verse number 28, which is posted on the walls in our auditorium. And that verse of scripture says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And I, I knew that the Lord was talking to me. And, uh, and I accepted his invitation that night. And and I received Jesus Christ. 
as my personal Lord and Savior. And uh, the very next day, I was enrolled in Pacific Garden Mission's New Life program, our Bible discipleship program, and uh, began to uh, be taught the Word of God. And uh, I began to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. I began to understand personal responsibility, and I began to understand that um, I had been irresponsible and, uh, and had rebelled against uh, good parents. I had actually thrown out you know, my parents' value system and as a result, I found myself, you know, um, basically a vagabond from what I had been taught and, and a vagabond literally just kind of wandering from city to city. And, and, uh, but, uh, but here I am today as the missions chaplain and, and pastor, and, and uh, I have the privilege of, of preaching and teaching here at Pacific Garden Mission because that is the purpose of this ministry is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and while uh, there's a large social end to what we do as a ministry, uh, we are not a social organization. Our purpose is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, which we have done now for almost 138 years. And for that, you know, I say to God be the glory, uh, great things um, he has done. But not only uh, the privilege to preach the gospel here um, at this ministry, but um, as an ambassador for Christ, I've been allowed uh, to go out uh, uh, by invitation primarily and preach the gospel um, all over the United States of America. I've traveled as far west as California. I've traveled as far northeast as New Hampshire. Uh, I've traveled into the south, into Georgia and Alabama and all over the Midwest states, uh, uh, Illinois and Indiana and Iowa and uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota and so on preaching uh, the unsearchable riches of Christ in, in local churches and in school buildings and so forth and have been very, very well received and, uh, and have seen uh, lives change um, literally everywhere God has allowed me to go because sin is no respecter of persons. Um, you know, sometimes I, I, I kind of get the impression when visitors come through and they look at the population here at Pacific Garden Mission and they, they maybe kind of think that sin is confined, you know, to uh, a ministry like Pacific Garden Mission, but sin is no respecter of persons. Um, sin is, is, is nationwide, literally it's worldwide. And so I praise God for the opportunity to, uh, to travel and to, to preach the gospel. We thank the Lord just for um, what he's continuing to do in, in my life. And, and 20 years ago, um, um, God brought my, my wife and myself. I was here back in 1979 until 1988 and uh, moved to Bible college and was gone for seven years. But when I came back in 1995, God allowed my dear wife, Flossie, to come with me. And she's uh, now the director of the Unshackle program for almost 20 years. It is a privilege uh, to serve the Lord uh, here at Pacific Garden Mission, and I'm just trusting God for what he will continue to do in my life. I hope you were challenged by the testimonies you just watched at Pacific Garden Mission, lives that have been changed by Jesus Christ. And wherever you are right now, Jesus can change your life. And I want you to be encouraged because if you'll stay with us, you're going to hear a gospel message and then a clear invitation on how you can receive Jesus Christ as your personal savior. It's not knowing about Jesus, it's having a relationship with him. That's when the change starts and you can have hope, peace and joy in the future if you'll just do that. So come by here or call the number on your screen and get help today and we'll be so happy that you did. And now if you'd like to come here and visit, you can do that too. If you're in the Chicagoland area, just stop by. We have tours every Saturday, followed by the live radio drama Unshackled. Then we'll have a nice dinner in our cafeteria, and we'll follow that with the gospel message you're going to see next, preached by our president, Pastor Phil. It's a wonderful day for us all to get together. You can meet some of the men that you've seen their testimonies, some of the women too. Uh, view some of the things that we do here and meet some of the people in our programs, the New Life and New Day programs where God is making a tremendous difference in their lives. And we'll be excited to have you and welcome you as you do. And then if you'd like to volunteer here, you can sign up for volunteer experiences. You can make beds upstairs. You can serve meals in the cafeteria. We have women who come and pray with women and men who come and pray with the men. Meet some of the men in our uh, programs. Maybe you want to get involved in a career development phase. Maybe you have a business in Chicago. You'd like to hire some of the people that graduate uh, the New Life program. They make excellent workers and we're just so happy that you would come here and get involved with us. And so please do that. 
And finally, we accept no government or state funding. Everything we do here is through gifts of private donations, people that care and want to see the uh, hand of God flourish here at Pacific Guard Mission, touching so many that walk through our doors. Yes, we feed, clothe, and shelter people that walk through our doors, but the main thing we do is give them the gospel message of Jesus Christ where they can be taken to their full potential and go back into their communities and restore their families and have a job and tithe at their churches and make a difference in society. That's what we're really looking to do. No matter what people's problems are, there's one simple solution and it's Jesus Christ our Savior. So please go to your secure website right now. You can give a one-time gift or a monthly recurring gift. And I know as you do, you'll be blessed because your partnership with God as you give your tithe and your donation here to Pacific Garden Mission it will actually help men and women come to their full potential. You'll be making a difference eternally, and I know that you'll be blessed as you do. Well, last week we saw the feeding of the multitude of the 5,000, but the question has been in the air in previous weeks. Matter of fact, it wasn't long ago when the disciples asked the questions after the storm was stilled, Again, real quickly, in Luke chapter 8 and verse 25, he said to them, Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man, what? Who is this? What, 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 what type of individual can still a storm, can raise the dead, can give sight to the blind, can give the leper their skin again? What type of man can feed the multitude? And that is still the question that many are asking. I was thinking during this Christmas season, one hymn that oftentimes is sung is, goes something like this. It's called, What Child Is This? What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Whom angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch they're keeping. And that's the question is, what, what, what child is this? And we have this image of Christmas time. We think of a babe and a manger and magi and coming down and giving gifts. And we celebrate, but the question still hangs over, what, what, what child is this? It's not a lot different than what the disciples asked when they were in the boat with him. What manner of man is this? I think of what the Bible says in John chapter 8 and verse 24, and I'll just read it to you before we look at the text tonight. Jesus said, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. So this question has eternal significance. It's not about just a little baby in a manger, isn't that little cute and wise men laying down and giving gifts and stuff. I say along with the disciples, what, what manner of man is this? Along with the, the hymn writer, what, what child is this? Because Jesus said in John chapter 8 that, I say therefore unto you that if ye shall die in your sins if ye believe not that I am He. You better know who I am because your salvation depends upon it. Matter of fact, in Luke chapter 9, we're going to look there. Luke chapter 9 and verse 18 came to pass as he was alone praying. His disciples were with him. So Jesus, after the feeding of the multitude, goes away and he begins to pray. As he's praying, his disciples are there with him and he asked them, saying, Whom say the people that I am? So we're going to see this question answered. But that's an amazing question. The question that the disciples asked not long ago after the stilling of the storm. What manner of man is this? And the buzz is going throughout the town. And at other portions of the Scripture, the, the Pharisees come and ask and say, How long uh, is it until you tell us? Who, who are you? What type of person is saying what you're saying and, and, and doing what you are doing? So Jesus asks the disciples, 
Whom say the people that, who are people saying that I am? We're going to see some various responses. Number one, we're going to see the answer of the masses, the mass of humanity. It says, they answering said, John the Baptist. Uh, remember, Herod thought that maybe John the Baptist had risen from the dead again, and that's what some were saying. Some were saying that you are John the Baptist, a good, powerful preacher. They was out there on the Jordan baptizing people and confronting people about their sin. Some say, Elijah, will the prophet say before the kingdom, before the glorious day of the Lord, that Elijah will come back? And that's who some are saying that you are. And others say that one of the prophets is risen again. Jesus asked a question. Who do people say that I am? The disciples said, well, the masses, the, the people are saying basically that you're human, you're a good guy, you're John the Baptist, you're one of the prophets, you're Elijah. That's what people are saying. You're a wonderful individual that is doing amazing stuff. You know, I know that question still lings, lingers over today. I was reading some quotes, and listen to this. I know men, and I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Between him and every other person in the world... There is no possible term of comparison. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I, and this is Napoleon speaking, have founded empires, but on what did we rest the creation of our genius? Upon force. Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love, and at this hour millions of men would die for him. Again, Napoleon himself knew that there is something different I know men and tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. I like what H.G. Wells said, listen to this, I am a historian and not a believer. He's writing this not from the perspective of a believer. But I must confess that as a historian, that this penniless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the very center of history. Jesus Christ is easily the most dominant figure in all of history, all the folks that have ever lived and died, the books that have ever been written, the kings that have ever reigned, this man, not a believer, said this man is the most dominant figure. The noted interviewer, listen to what Larry King said. Larry King once said that if he could choose one person to interview, from the course of human history, he would choose to interview Jesus Christ. King said that he would like to ask Jesus if he was indeed virgin born. He added, the answer to that question would define history for me. The answer to that question would define history. The question still resonates today by some of these quotes. The same with the disciples. What manner of man is this? Uh, Herod wanted to know, is this John the Baptist risen, risen from the dead? There was a, the people were asking, is he one of the prophets? Is he, is he a preacher? The, who is Jesus Christ? I want to let that one quotation ring in your ears. The answer to the question about the virgin birth would define history for me. You see, the Bible declares that Jesus Christ was indeed born of a virgin. It was declared in the Old Testament uh, by Isaiah, and we see it in the New Testament. But why was he virgin born? Well, real quickly, because Jesus already existed. I like Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, and I'll read it to you. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is what? Think about that. A child is born, but the son is what? The child was born, yes, in Bethlehem, but the son was given. You can only give something that already exists. Yeah, the child was born, but the son was given. And it says here, And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I think of Micah chapter 5, verse 2, But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, Yet out of these shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler of Israel, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. Now, 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 now think about that quotation for a moment. 
when the prophet Micah was talking about where the Messiah was going to be born, he named the city was Bethlehem, but he also was talking about his origins, and he said his going forth can never be pinpointed by time. It says because they are from everlasting. You see, he was virgin born because he had no origin in terms of time. He's from eternity. He's from everlasting. I think of John chapter 17, verse 5, Jesus praying, and he said, O oh, now, O oh, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Powerful quotation. Jesus said, Father, the glory, the Shekinah glory that we shared before the world was, he says, I'm going to die and I'm going to ascend and I'm going to be glorified with you again with the glory that you and I had from eternity past. This is no ordinary child that was born in a manger. This is no ordinary baby that with the magi came and saw. This is somebody from everlasting, from of old. This is somebody that shared the Shekinah glory with the Father from eternity past. Matter of fact, the Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word what? Think about that. Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and discussing Abraham, and I love John 8, 58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, what did he say? That's powerful. Why is it powerful? How did God re reveal himself to Moses in the burning bush? What name did God use? To, to any first century Jew, for a man to stand up and say, before Abraham was, I am. Well, how did you know that's how they took it? Because the next verse says they picked up stones to stone him. Another scripture, Jesus asked, for what good work do you stone me? And they said, for a good work we stone thee not, but that thou being a man, what? Makest thyself God. Well, we're stoning you not for what you're doing, but for what you're saying. You are saying things that nobody has ever seen before. And for a mere human being to say, and, and oh, when you read quotations of people from the past, you can read philosophers and kings and all this stuff and they will talk about showing you the way. Sometimes you can turn on television and somebody will get on there and if you buy their CD and their program, they will teach you how to lose weight. They will teach you how to be financially secure and I will show you the way and I will tell you the truth. But Jesus Christ says something absolutely different. He said, for what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Those words are absolutely stunning. This little child that was born in a manger, the ones that the disciples asked the question when they saw him still the sea, and they said, what manner of man? This guy is different from anybody that's ever existed. And then Jesus asked the question, he says, who are men saying that I am? And they listed a whole bunch of regular folks. Elijah, good man, but was a human, a man like we are. Well, what about John the Baptist, a good man, but also a man like we are? One of the prophets no, Jesus was the virgin-born Son of God. He also was born without sin. The Bible says in Romans 5, 12, Wherefore is by one what? One man. one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And, I, and listen to this here, and I've quoted this before, but there's always new ears here. This is out of M. R. DeHaan's book. He's a medical doctor. He wrote a book called The Chemistry of the Blood. Listen to this. It is now definitely known that the blood which flows in an unborn baby's arteries and veins is not derived from the mother, but is produced within the body of the fetus itself only after the int introduction of the male element. An unfertilized egg can never develop blood since the female egg does not by itself contain the elements essential for the production of this blood. It is only after the male element has entered the egg that blood can develop. And if as by one man sin entered into the world, and 
Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, though, yes, he had a human body and he had emotions and feeling and a mind, yet God was his father. He didn't partake of our bloodline. The Bible says he had precious blood. How can Jesus come and live amongst us and yet be sinless? Because he didn't have our blood. If the blood comes from the Father, Jesus was virgin born. Amen? Amen. Jesus was born of a virgin. He didn't partake of our, of our bloodline. So therefore, though he was human when he came here, yes, from eternity, the virgin born Son of God. The Bible says in John 1.14, And the Word was what? Made flesh and dwelt amongst us. The Word was made flesh. So let's look back again, if you would, to Luke chapter 9. The disciples answered, or, uh, answered the question, what do the masses say? Well, the masses are saying that you're a great guy, John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets. But he goes on a little further here, and what did Jesus himself say? Look at verse 26. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory. I'm going to come back, but I'm going to come back in my what? In my own glory. Look at that there. And in his fathers and of the holy angels, and I will tell you a truth. There be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. It doesn't mean the, the rapture there because we're going, some are going to see the kingdom of God and we're going to see it in the next section here as he continues to answer the question. Who, who do men say that I am? Well, the masses say you're John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets. I'm telling you, I'm coming back in my own glory. Matter of fact, I'm going to show you something. Look at verse 28. came to pass about eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white as glistening. So all of a sudden, there he is, and now this word that was made flesh now we see the flesh for a second now is set aside and we see him in his full glory, the deity of Jesus Christ. And there he is. I'm, I ask you a question. Who do, you, who do men say that I am? Who, who, who do? And they, they say, wow. And, and now that they get to see him here, they saw him as he was. Now, now, now look at this here. And behold, there talked with him two men which were Moses and Elijah. I mean, so this also shows me a few things, that there is life after death. Moses died years ago. Elijah was taken to heaven. I'm sure after Moses died, they wept. And many times it's a trivia question. Remember Moses was never allowed into the promised land? Sometimes somebody says, was Moses ever in the promised land? Here he is right here, amen? <laughs> little delayed, but he got there, right? But Moses, he's there talking with Elijah, and they're talking to Jesus Christ about what's going to happen. So this shows me dead people are still alive. They're conscious, and they're also aware of events that are transpiring on this planet, and also they can be recognized. However, James and John and Peter knew who they were. They were recognizable. That, that, that tells us that when we die, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and there Jesus Christ is. Real quick, if you would, and we're still in the transfiguration, but I, I want to just again look at the answers uh, of the disciples. Look, if you would, to verse 20, then we'll uh, switch over again to the transfiguration. Verse 20. This is what Peter said, and he said to them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered, said, The what? The masses say Moses. The masses say, or the masses say, John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets. I'm telling you, I believe the, the disciples said, you're the Christ of God. Jesus said, you're going to see me come back in my glory. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you a glimpse of it right now. Now they're showing him the glory, and there he is talking with, with Elijah and Moses. And just imagine this little child in Bethlehem. There he was, and now he has grown up, and he's on the Mount of Transfiguration. His flesh is set aside and they see the glory of Almighty God. And he's conversing with Moses and Elijah, verse 31, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. 
Can you imagine that conversation? Moses and Elijah, man, Jesus, Lord, you're going to go to Jerusalem where you're going to be slain. But, but I'm sure they knew it was for their sin because the penalty, the wages of sin is death. And both of them, though good men, were sinners and they needed a sacrifice. And Jesus was talking about his soon coming crucifixion. He was talking about it again with Moses and Elijah. So people that have died, yes, they're still alive and conscious. They are recognizable and they're also aware of events that are transpiring as they're talking to Jesus. Look at this here. And he says, But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with what? Now, I love Peter. I think most folks, when you talk about Peter, they identify with him more than any disciple because he was a man just like we are, a man with his faults, a man at times who was frail, but I always find it interesting at some of the most crucial moments in history, what do we find Peter doing? Sleeping. The Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus is praying and he sweat great drops of blood, Peter, sleeping. In the book of Acts, when Paul was incarcerated, he was singing. When Peter was incarcerated, he was sleeping. And the angel had to kick him so hard. I don't know, something with Peter here. But... um. Again, verse 32, But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep, and when they awoke, they saw his, his glory. It wasn't the glory of God, it was his glory. Jesus is different. Who, 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 who do men say that I am? Well, what manner of man is this? The quotes from so many people, Jesus Christ is different, and now there he is standing in his glory, and the disciples wake up, and the two men that stood with him, verse 33, came to pass as they departed from him. Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. He didn't know what he said. He just woke up, I'm making tabernacles, you know, whatever. He's really saying something no different than the masses were saying. Yes, he just declared that Jesus Christ was the Christ, the Son of the living God. But now waking up out of his sleep, he wanted to put all three on the same plane. Let's make three booths or tabernacles for you and for Elijah and for Moses. So we heard the question, or the question was asked, Who do men say that I am? What manner of man is this? Who is Jesus Christ? We're going to find that answered by a definitive source. Verse 34. While he thus spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son. Hear him. The Father declared who he was. What I find interesting also about this section of Scripture is Jesus didn't reveal Himself to everybody because the Pharisees were curious. Who is He? Herod wanted to know, is He John the Baptist risen from the dead? Many of the multitudes were curious, is this Jesus Christ? Who is He? He didn't reveal Himself to everybody, but by only to His disciples. And I do believe as you respond to the revelation that God gives to you that He will give you more. But you, when you reject the truth that God gives you, He will cease giving you any. And there's some here tonight, God has been trying to reach you. He's trying to speak to you. And then you're, oh God, I want to see the, uh, the clouds parted and the heavens open. No, you respond to what you know right now. Peter, James, and John, yes, they saw something that nobody has ever seen before. They saw the glory of God as Jesus Christ was talking and conversing with, with Elijah and with Moses. But God Himself, the Father, declares, this is my what? Son. This is not like Elijah. This is not like Moses. 
This is not like John the Baptist or one of the prophets. The reason he still the storm is because he is my son. The reason he rose the dead is because he is my son. The reason he gives sight to the blind because he is my son. This child, this babe that was born in a manger is not some cuddly, cute little kid. He is my son. Hear him. Real quick, again, I think of a famous verse, John 3, 16. And again, many times there's new ears, and I want you to hear this because oftentimes the, uh, the question in the course of a week gets asked oftentimes. Look at this here. For God so loved the world that He gave His only what? Now that word only begotten is incredibly important. See, the word begotten is the, in the Greek is, is of the same essence as. Of the same nature and essence. God gave His only, not many, only, only begotten of the same essence and nature as. Only begotten what? Son. Sometimes people ask and say, how can Jesus Christ be the Son of God and God? I'll ask you the question, how could He not be? I, I often give this illustration, but I want you to hear it again. If a cow gives birth to a calf, is the calf the son of a cow? Yes. But because he's a son of a cow, by nature he is a cow. If a dog gives birth to a pup, is that pup the son of a dog? Because he's the son of a dog, by nature he must be a dog. If a cat gives birth to a kitten, that kitten is the son of a cat. Because he's the son of a cat, he has to be a cat. I can go on and on, but I think you get the point. <laughs> Jesus Christ was virgin born, had no earthly father. Jesus Christ already existed from everlasting. And God said, this is my beloved son. And if Jesus Christ is by nature the son of God, by nature he must be who? God. You answered your own question. You can say, well, wait a second now. Uh, we that are saved, aren't we all sons of God? Yes, the Bible says in the book of Galatians, by adoption. I've been adopted. I'm not natural. Naturally, the Bible says in the book of John, you're of your father the devil. Amen? That's who I am in my nature. But I've been adopted into the family as a son. But naturally, Jesus Christ is the only begotten of the Father of the same essence and of the same nature as. And that's why, listen, in John 5, 23 and 24, this is what Jesus says, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. To a Jewish culture, how did they honor the Father? They had reverence for the Father. Oh, Jehovah, Elohim, Yahweh. They reverence Him. And Jesus says, All men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which sent Him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth My word and believeth on Him that sent Me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. That's who this child is. God the Father testified, this is my beloved Son. Hear Him. Jesus asked the question, who, who do men say that I am? He heard various opinions, some Moses, and the Father said, I'm going to tell you who He is. I'm going to show you, you see His glory, and I'm going to tell you, this is my, this is my Son. Real quick, look if you would to 2 Peter chapter 1. Peter, matter of fact, years later comments on the transfiguration. 2 Peter chapter 1. Look at this here. 2 Peter chapter 1. Look if you would to verse 14. 2 Peter 1, 14. He says here, Knowing that shortly I must put off this, ta my, this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me, Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. Listen to this. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were what? Now, now, now in a court of law, eyewitness testimony is powerful testimony. I've done this during the uh, uh, resurrection season. There's many events in history that you and I believe 
that nobody was a first-hand witness of, but we have no problem believing it. I think the death of Socrates was narrated to us in third person by somebody who wasn't there, but he heard from somebody who was. Nobody questions it. The death of Julius Caesar was narrated to us by somebody who wasn't there. Nobody questions it. What does Peter say? He says, listen, I'm not telling you about a fable. I'm not talking about some story. Peter says, matter of fact, I was the what? I was there. That's why you have four Gospels. That's why they say the same thing. And John says, I saw it. And James saw it. Mark wrote about it. And Matthew wrote about it. We know it. And Peter says, we're not telling you about some fable. So if you want to be intellectually consistent and talk about facts of history in the past that you believe because people were eyewitnesses. Peter here says, I'm not telling you about a fable. I'm telling you about a fact. How do you know I was there? I went on that mountain. I know what I saw. As a matter of fact, Peter died a martyr's death to testify to this fact. Peter the fisherman, who in Jesus Christ was alive, denied him and ran away temporarily. After Jesus Christ died, what did he have to gain? Unless I saw it, and I want to tell you, I was there. This stuff happened. Look at this here. For we received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to Him from the excellent glory. This is what Peter says. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, he says what? We heard I'm not giving you a second-hand testimony. You see, that's how when you look in history, you say, prove it scientifically. You can never prove science. You can never prove history scientifically, any event in history, because you have to recreate it in a laboratory, and you can't recreate history in a laboratory. What you do is you get first-hand testimony. Did somebody see it? Was there numerous witnesses? Did they write about it? Peter says, I saw it. James saw it. John saw it. We were there. He said, and this is the voice which came from heaven. We what? We heard when we were with him where? In the holy mount. He asked us a question. Who do men say that I am? Oh, yes, some John, some Elijah, some the prophets. Who do men say they am? Peter, you're, you're the Christ of God, the Son of the living God. Who do men say that I am? Let me take you and show you for a second. And they saw his glory as he conversed with Moses and Elijah. And Father ended the debate and said, This here is not Moses. This here is not Elijah. This is not one of the prophets. This is my virgin-born son, Jesus Christ, the Holy One. Listen to him. End of debate. I'll close with this quote, and it's a quote many of you have heard before, but it's still one of my favorite when we talk about Jesus. When you look at the statements that Jesus made, I am the way. So the quote I gave you earlier that all men should honor the Son as they honor the Father. That's a powerful statement. I give unto them eternal life. Amazing statement for an individual to make. This is a quote by C.S. Lewis, and this is what I'll I'll close with. Listen to this. And I want you to hear this. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I am ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher. And that's what the masses thought. He was a great moral teacher. It says, but I don't accept his claim to be God when Jesus said, I am. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. If he said, I give to you eternal life, and he was lying. If he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father but by me, and he wasn't. If he said, all men should honor the Son as they honor the Father, but it wasn't true, he wouldn't be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God or else a madman or something worse. 
You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him. You can kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. And he did not intend to. My friend, this Christmas season, it wasn't just a babe in a manger. This was God in flesh who has come to visit us. His name is Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. As you're here tonight and we want to give an invitation for salvation because that, that really is what it's all about. It's not about Christmas and a tree and presents. It's about Jesus. It's about eternal life. And I'm not talking about joining a church or a program or a group or running around. I'm saying you and I are humans. We have sinned. There is an afterlife. If, if Moses and Elijah were seen long after they were dead, thousands of years... You and I are going to be alive long after this physical body dies. And my question is, where will you be? If you were to die and stand before a holy God, you and I have sinned, and the wages of sin is death. If God in His justice would give us an account for our iniquities and our wrongs, all of us would be found guilty. The Bible says all have sinned. But the good news is God sent the payment his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, died in your place. God demands death because of sin. The Bible says the second death is the lake of fire. Because of sin, He demands death. Jesus Christ died to satisfy the wrath of God. And if you accept Jesus Christ, you are accepting His payment for your sin. But if you reject, you pay yourself. It's your choice. If you're here tonight and say, Pastor, I need to be forgiven. I want to be pardoned. I want all my sins forgiven. Would you please raise your hand all throughout the auditorium? I need to be forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else tonight? I need to be forgiven. You with your hands raised, I want you to pray with me in the quietness of your heart. Pray something simple. Just say, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. And tonight I believe Jesus Christ died for my sin. Forgive me. Pardon me. I believe you rose again. Tonight, I receive you as my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, I pray that you were challenged by that message because that is really one of life's most important questions. Who is Jesus Christ? He asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And we ask you today, you need to know who Jesus Christ is. Yes, he was the baby that was born in Bethlehem, but he is the glorious Son of God, God revealed in the flesh, the one who died for your sin, to pay the penalty for you. And you might ask the question, why did Jesus die? Well, it's man that sinned in the garden. God told Adam, the day you eat, you shall surely die. Death penalty for sin. And since man made the infraction, only man can pay the penalty. So Jesus Christ, though God, became man to pay our penalty for us, but only God can pay an eternal penalty. And that's what Jesus Christ did. You see, salvation, in one sense, it is very simple. The Bible says, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shall be saved. It's not about church attendance or good works or God weighing your good and bad. And that's really what most people believe. And maybe some of you that are watching today and you're watching what you feel is a religious show, and you think, well, when I die and stand before the, the maker, I hope I've done enough good and he'll weigh my good and bad. That's false. God will not weigh our good and bad because if he would, I ask the question, why did Jesus die? He died because it was imperative. He had to die for our sins. And that's how we are forgiven and saved. When you come to a point where you realize, I can't save myself. I, I can't. There's nothing I can do to forgive myself, to save myself, to gain eternal life. I am not good enough. God sent the sacrifice, Jesus Christ. He is the one who died for your sin. A very simple illustration. If I'd go outside and, and I'd get pulled over for speeding, 
I could tell the officer how good I am, it wouldn't matter because you broke the law now and you have to pay the appropriate penalty now. Say you've never speeded in the past, it doesn't matter. Say in, in, the, in the future you promise never to speed again, it doesn't matter. I caught you on my radar gun and here's a ticket. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Say I didn't sin a lot before, I've still lied. Say I promise never to sin again. My question to you is who is going to pay for the sin you've already committed? It has to be paid for. The good news is Jesus Christ paid for that sin. I remember a young man I asked that question to, I said, who's going to pay for your sin? He said, I guess I'll have to do it myself. Well, that's true. That's why hell exists. You have to pay for your sin yourself then. But God in his love gave the payment so we don't have to. Jesus, though God was also man, and he paid the penalty for your sin. And if you trust Jesus Christ today as your savior, God offers you a pardon. Why don't you cry out to God right now? Why don't you pray with me? Ask Jesus Christ to be your savior? P pray a simple prayer, bow your head. Say, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I know as a sinner I deserve hell, but today I call upon Jesus Christ as my savior. Forgive me, in Jesus' name, amen. If you pray to trust Jesus Christ as your savior and sin bearer, we rejoice with you. Why don't you write us, let us know. If you just enjoy this program, when we get your letters, we are excited. Why don't you let, let us know what God is doing through this program in your life. God bless you and thank you for watching.